about this. So let me just turn it over to you and uh, get away. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I'm uh, John O'Rourke, and I basically I do um, evangelistic work. I work with an organization called Reformed Evangelistic Fellowship, REF. Um, and I have a ministry under that, full armor ministry. We'll talk about that um, in a minute. But I'll be teaching you, um, in this class, logic, and then I'll teach another class afterwards, later on this year, on apologetics, which both of these are very much related to one another. So if you pay attention in this class, you'll do better in apologetics. This is important. Um, so let's talk about logic, and then we'll, then we'll get acquainted a little bit. I want to give a little introduction for why we're doing this class. Then I'll learn your names, tell you about myself a little bit more, and, and we'll get into it. So first off, why are we studying logic in this discipleship program? You live in a world and in a generation that is filled with bad argumentation. Okay? Bad arguments are everywhere. Moreover, you are in a world and a generation that is persuaded by bad arguments. Okay? That's a problem. There's so many inconsistencies, there's arbitrariness, there's muddled thinking everywhere you look. There's irrationality. And that shouldn't be the case, especially for Christians. That shouldn't be the case. We ought to be ones who are thinking according with truth, consistently, not arbitrarily. If we're going to love God with our minds, we have to think logically like God does. We'll talk about that in this course. We have to be able to discern truth from error, and logic will help us do that. And we cannot be taken in by foolish arguments, okay, by irrational things that sound like they're good arguments, but in reality are fallacious. That means they have errors in the reasoning. So if you really focus, if you really focus in this class, we'll have a lot of fun in this class, I think, um, and go through the principles for correct reasoning and logic. But if you really pay attention and you focus, you're going to be able to see through bad arguments. We're going to spend a lot of time um, discussing fallacies, which is being able to see through bad arguments. You're going to be able to formulate good arguments, okay, which is important, and that's important Good arguments that are pleasing to the Lord. Arguments that are consistent. Arguments that are true. Not false. They are not trying to prove a false conclusion. And you'll be miles ahead of just about everybody else in this culture in terms of critical thinking. Very few people study logic today. That wasn't the case in the past, but very few people study logic today. Now maybe, and I hope, that you have studied logic before. But if you haven't, this is, this is going to be really helpful to you. Even if you have studied it before, this will be helpful to you, I believe. So it's important that we understand why we're studying logic and what our motivation is, and so that we can think better, reason better, not be taken in by foolish arguments, and do all those things to glorify God with our minds and with our thinking. So that's, uh, that's a little introduction there for logic. So let's, uh, let's talk. Now, by the way, I'm not really a PowerPoint person. I don't like teaching from PowerPoints. I'm going to try to keep up with it as best I can. Um, but... Um, here we go. So the objective in this class is to glorify God by learning to reason and to form arguments according to the rules of logic. That's what we want to do. We want to think logically, in other words. We will be using this book, Introduction to Logic, by Jason Lyle. Um, I've been informed that we don't have those books yet, but you'll get them soon, I believe. Great book, um, easy to read, easy to understand. So I'm going to have you um, read through that whole book. And the chapters are really, by and large, quite short. Um, Supplementary material that I've used to build this class is another book by Jason Lyle called Discerning Truth. This is about evolutionary arguments in particular. I've also used a, a lecture series by Dr. Greg Bonson called Critical Thinking and some online sources as well that have helped me get some examples that we'll use. Um, so about myself, like I said, I um, do full armor ministries under Reformed, Evangelist, Reformed Evangelistic Fellowship. Basically, um, what I do is I go around on the streets and do evangelism. I go and bring the gospel to people on the streets. So that's really part of the reason why I'm teaching logic and apologetics to you, because that's really what I use on a day-to-day -day basis. I go out and talk to people. If they're unbelievers, we will argue worldviews. We'll argue, I'll argue for the truth of Christianity. They may argue for the truth of some other worldview or the so-called truth of some other worldview, and we'll debate. And that's exactly what we see, you know, for example, in the New Testament, Paul would reason with people and try to persuade people with arguments. And that's uh, basically what I do. I also go out to the abortion clinic that's in Bristol, Tennessee, and do the same type of thing. Go out there to do some open air preaching, try to reach out to the mothers and fathers there and uh, try to save babies' lives. And then, like Terry mentioned, I do have some online stuff. He said the podcast weekly. 
sometimes it's weekly, um, sometimes it's not, but I, um, I do put out stuff, which includes conversations, audio recordings of me talking to people doing evangelism, as well as some theological stuff as well. Um, so, and that's uh, basically what that is. All right, so let's talk about what we're gonna go over in this class here. This is a very basic outline. We're gonna talk today, well, I don't know how far we'll get today, we're gonna talk about parts of an argument today. Propositions, premises, and conclusion. We'll talk about types of arguments, about um, deductive and, and inductive arguments. We'll talk about sound versus valid arguments. We'll talk about the laws of logic, the three basic laws of logic, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, and the law of identity. We'll talk about definitions, that is, actual definitions of words. We're going to study definitions themselves. There's various types of definitions, like lexical, stipulative, precising, theoretical, and a persuasive argument. Yes, Jack? This stuff, not, you don't have to take notes so far. This, this course is going to follow the structure of the book that you're going to get. Now, unfortunately, you don't have. Um, there is going to be some handouts soon that are going to have exercises that we will do in class. Um, once we get into the material itself, you should start taking notes. Um, like once we get into parts of an argument, I'm just kind of giving you a sneak peek on what we're going to cover in this class going forward. But I'll, I'll tell you when we get into the real material. Um, we're just doing a quick overview. So we'll talk about definitions. And finally, and really the biggest chunk of this class is the last thing, informal fallacies. Okay? There's three major categories, fallacies of ambiguity, presumption, and relevance. And there's lots of different fallacies underneath those. And fallacies are errors in reasoning. So this is our basic outline. We have a lot to cover in all these sections, especially the last one. Um, but that's what we're going to be going over in this class, just to get you prepared for that. This thing's not even going forward. That's why I don't use uh, PowerPoints too much. But uh, all right, let's talk about logics. Now you want to. Now you're going to want to start taking notes if you're if you're going to take notes. So, are there any questions so far? Are we are we good on the introductory stuff, right? Good. Okay. Before we get into the material, I'd like to learn all of your names, or at least hear them, and, and hopefully learn them. So, if we can go around the room. So, my name is Mr. John O'Rourke. So I'll be your teacher in this class, like I said. And if we can start over here, what's your name? I'm Brooke. Brooke? Okay. Sorry. Andrew. Andrew. Brian. Brian. Margaret. Margaret. Theo. Say again. Theo. Theo. Okay. Karis. Karis. Olivia. Olivia. Jen. Jem. Jen. Jen. Okay. My name's April. April. Terry. <laughs> I know you guys are over there. Okay. Great. All right, so if you have any questions, just please just raise your hand and I'll call on you and we can talk. Um, I want this class to be, it's going to end up being more discussion oriented in some parts of it um, because we will be talking about why something is uh, an error in reasoning and things like that. So what is logic? This is really important question. The basic question for this course is the study of the principles for correct reasoning. Okay, and the study of the principles for correct reasoning. That's what logic is. We're going to be studying the principles for correct reasoning. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about logic and the moral obligation to be logical. You all have Bibles with you? I want to look up some, some scripture verses together. Um, we have a moral obligation as human beings under the law of God um, to be logical. Incorrect reasoning and bad argumentation is a form of lying. It's ninth commandment breaking. You are trying to persuade somebody of something by illegitimate means by means that are not consistent, by means that are not true. We're commanded to take every thought captive to obey Christ. I want you to turn there to 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians 10, verse 5. This is what the Apostle Paul says for us as Christians that we do. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. 
Now, we will be talking about that verse particularly in defense of the Christian worldview in our next class. But I want you to take note of that, that we are to take every thought captive to obey Christ. We're going to love Christ with our minds. We need to think like him. We'll talk about that a lot more in apologetics, but I want to get this in your mind even now, that we need to think the way that God thinks, and God thinks logically. So let's look at the next one. So God's always truthful, okay? And therefore, he's always logical. He's always consistent. Let's look up Hebrews 6, 18. And as you turn there, I want to ask you a question. What does it mean that God is omnipotent? Does anybody know? What's that? So that's omniscient. That's omnipresent. There's the last one now. Omnipotence is the other one. <laughs> so he's all knowing, he's all present, and what? All powerful. All powerful. So somebody could define what that means, though, because I think sometimes we need, to, we need to precise that definition a little bit. What's it mean that God is all powerful? Does it, does it mean that God can do anything? Do you think that's a good definition? He can't sin. Okay. And that's what we're going to get into. So here, here's a good definition of omnipotence. God can do anything that's consistent with his nature and his character. Okay? God can do anything that's consistent with his nature and character. For example, can God cease to exist? No. Why? Because he's eternal in his nature. Can God lie? No, because that's inconsistent with his character. And we'll see that here in Hebrews 6, 18. Hebrews 6, 18. He says, so that by two unchangeable things in which, is, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So he's saying that God made promises. He swore by an oath to Abraham in this context. And he's saying it's impossible for God to lie. So he can't say yes and no about the same thing at the same time in the same sense. He can't contradict himself, which is what lying, contradiction um, is a form of lying. Look at 2 Timothy um, 2, 13. This is a wonderful, wonderful text. I should encourage you. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why? For he cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself. If we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Okay? God is not self-contradictory. Okay? He does not contradict himself. Therefore, God's word does not contradict itself either, by the way. But God cannot contradict himself. Contradictions are a form of lying, and it's impossible for God to lie. So since God, in his character, is not self-contradictory, he's not a liar, he is opposed to inconsistencies and contradictions. Let's look at 2 Timothy 6. Turn over a few pages. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 6, rather. It'll be 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. 1 Timothy 6, 20. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Listen to this part. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. God is opposed to contradictory claims. He's opposed, he says, reject contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. He's saying it's not real knowledge because it's contradictory. It's irreverent babble and contradictions from these false teachers that Tim Timothy is supposed to guard the, the gospel against false teachers who speak irrationally, self-contradictorily. And finally, we'll look at uh, Titus. Turn over a few to, to Titus chapter 1. Right after 2 Timothy there. Titus chapter 1. And the qualifications for elders in the church, the elders are supposed to be able to do something here in, in Titus 1.9. It 
This is what he must be able to do. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word that's taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Okay? There is a such thing as contradictions and we are to reject that which contradicts God's word. That which contradicts truth is error. Okay? So logical fallacies are, which we'll get to later on in the class, are attempting to persuade someone of something by illegitimate means, which is dishonest. So to sum up this little section here, we do have a moral obligation to think like God thinks. We are to be imitators of God in this way, to think consistently, to reject contradictions, to not speak out of both sides of our mouth, but to speak plainly. And we'll we'll talk about this more as we go through the class, but here's a little introduction. It's important. God requires of us to to argue, argue honestly instead of arguing in a, in a dishonest or illegitimate way. All right, so now let's get into uh, the nitty-gritty of things. We're going to talk about what an argument um, actually is. So what is an argument? Okay, an argument is made up of propositions. Propositions are um, an assertion that something is true. Okay, propositions are a truth claim. Propositions may start like this. It is the case that, and then you say something, it's a truth claim. Okay, asserting something is true. Um, and, a, and a proposition is what a sentence means with regard to what it asserts to be true. This is important. So if somebody says, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that's a proposition. That's a truth claim. If somebody said this, Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, is that the same sentence? No, it's not the same sentence. First sentence was Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The second one, Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. It's a different word order, different, uh, different words used, but they are the same proposition, aren't they? They are making the same truth claim. Whether you say it like this, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, or you say Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, they are the same proposition. They are the same truth claim. So we want to look and see what is the truth claim that somebody is making. Right? So when somebody makes a proposition, they are making a truth claim. It is the case that P, and P stands for whatever they are uh, making the claim for. So that's what a proposition is. Even though you might have two different sentences, um, they can still have the same proposition. And propositions can be true or false. Okay, propositions are truth claims, but they aren't necessarily actually true. If I said all dogs are purple, that is a proposition. It's not a true one, but it is a proposition. I'm making the claim. It is the case that all dogs are purple. That's a false proposition. Propositions are called true or false. Okay, propositions are either true or false. Arguments, on the other hand, are not said to be true or false. They're said to be good or bad. Okay, so arguments are not true or false. They are good or bad. Propositions are true or false. But arguments, on the other hand, are good or bad. So an argument is made up of propositions, made up of truth claims. That's what an argument is. It's a a series of propositions, okay? An argument can be made up of either true or false propositions, which relates to the soundness of an argument, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And the conclusion either follows from those first propositions or it doesn't. And that's what relates to the validity, which we'll talk about in a minute. So a proposition is true if it's something that God would say. Okay? That's the ultimate standard of whether something is true or not. The proposition is true if God would say, yes, it is the case that blank. A true, prop- a true proposition comports with reality. A true proposition is consistent with what is real. A true proposition is actually what is the case in reality. A false proposition is the opposite. Um, false proposition is fal- a proposition is false if it contradicts or is consistent with truth. Um, and that's what we'll, we'll look at um, as we go through this class. All right. Any questions about what a proposition is? So what's a proposition? A truth claim. Okay, a truth claim. A proposition is a truth claim. Arguments are made up of propositions. Now let's talk about what we call these propositions. 
In an argument, you basically have two kinds of propositions. You have premises and you have one conclusion. So an argument has premises and then it has a conclusion, a single conclusion. Okay? Premises and conclusions are both propositions. Okay? Remember, all, all the things in an argument are truth claims, but there are premises and conclusions and those are all propositions. They both assert, both premises and conclusions assert something to be true. So a premise, what's a premise? A premise is a proposition in an argument that is used as evidence to support the conclusion. A premise is a proposition in an argument that is used as evidence to support the conclusion. And that premise, again, may be true or false. The premise may be true or false, but it's intended to support the conclusion of the argument. Okay? And the, proposition, the conclusion is the proposition in an argument that the person is attempting to prove. So what are you trying to prove? That's your conclusion. How do you, what do you use to support your conclusion? Those are the premises. Okay? All of them are propositions. They're all truth claims. Um, but uh, the premises support the conclusion, or supposed to, and the conclusion is what you're trying to prove. Sometimes arguments will have what we can call conclusion indicators. Okay? If somebody says, therefore, that might be an indication that they're going to give you their conclusion to their argument. Okay? If somebody says, thus, that might be another indicator of a conclusion. Or so, or consequently, or in conclusion, or I conclude, or based upon the previous points, we can conclude whatever. Those are some words that people use. Therefore is probably the most popular. Therefore, it is the case that whatever you're trying to prove is true. So the conclusion does not have to have an obvious conclusion indicator in it, but they are oftentimes there. Okay. So in a good argument, the conclusion follows from the premises. Okay? The, the premises actually support the conclusion. The conclusion is true. This is important. The conclusion is true if the premises are true and the conclusion follows from the premises. Okay? We're going to talk about this in detail in a second. But if the premises are true, the supporting propositions, the premises are true, and the conclusion actually follows from those premises, then the conclusion is true. So a good argument has two characteristics. Okay? Remember, we're talking about arguments as either good or bad. A good argument has two characteristics. It has true premises, and the conclusion logically follows from the premises. Okay? So, premises and conclusions. Somebody tell me, what is a premise? The evidence towards your conclusion. Yes. So it's a proposition that's meant to support the conclusion. What's the conclusion? The point? Yeah, the point you're trying to prove by your argument. So arguments are made up of propositions. Those propositions are either premises, and then there's a conclusion. OK, good, very good. All right. Let's talk about sound versus valid arguments. These are attributes of arguments. All right, so for any argument to be good, it has to be valid and it has to be sound, and those are distinct things. Okay, we need to know what they mean as well. A good argument has to be valid and sound. I should say a good deductive argument needs to be valid and sound. We'll talk about deductive and inductive in a minute. So deductive arguments are said to be valid or invalid, and they're said to be sound or unsound. Okay, when we talk about deductive arguments, which we'll get to in a minute. And then the other kind, inductive arguments, are said to be strong or weak. So when we talk about... Um, Deductive arguments, we're going to talk about that. Are they valid or invalid? Are they sound or unsound? When we get to inductive arguments, we'll say, is that a strong inductive argument or is that a weak inductive argument? So we'll talk about validity now. What does it mean that an argument is valid? Well, that means the conclusion follows from the premises, logically. That the conclusion actually is supported from the premises. An argument is valid if the truth of the premises logically guarantees the truth of the conclusion. So an argument is valid if the premises and conclusion are related to each other in the right way, so that if the premises were true, then the conclusion would have to be true as well. But an argument, this is important, an argument can be valid and still have false premises. And that's what we have up there on the projector. What's the first premise? in this argument. All about the That's right. Is that true? Is that a true proposition? No. no. Okay, second, what's the second premise? That's right. 
Let's just assume that is true. We'll, we'll give them that. Thirdly, what's the, what's the conclusion there? It's therefore bingo is purple. Does that follow logically? If the premises are true, is the conclusion definitely true? Yes, right. If it's the case that all dogs are truly purple and bingo is a dog, then bingo also must be purple. Doesn't that follow logically? Yeah, this is a valid argument, right? It's a valid argument, but it's not a sound one, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is a valid argument. The, the conclusion does indeed follow from the premises. You see what validity means? That's all it means. You don't have to worry about the content at all. It, all that matters is, does the conclusion follow from the premises? Okay, that's what validity means. The bingo argument here is a valid argument, but it is not sound. All right, so valid arguments have to have the correct structure, in other words. They have to have the correct structure, and that's all that matters when it comes to determining whether an argument is valid or not, as long as it has the right structure. Does it have the right structure so that the conclusion follows from the premises? If it does, then the argument is valid. Okay, it's valid. For example, I'm not sure if we have this. I might just write this on the board. Um, yeah, we don't. So if we have this, I was going to ask. <laughs> all right. So these are just letters. All right. So what's our, what's our um, by the way, these little dots here mean therefore. Okay. It's all triangle dots. So what's the, what are the premises? What's the first premise? Okay. All M or V. What's the second premise? Sorry if I'm in the way. What's the second premise? Right. And then the conclusion? All right. Is this argument valid? How's it, why is it valid? It <clears throat> right? Can you, can you explain it? Can you walk us through it? Somebody walk us through why the conclusion does indeed follow from the premises? Well, if all ends are these, and all zebra ends, then all zebra ends. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good reading. Very good reading. All right. Let me, let me explain it to you. Look, if all C's are M's and all M's are V's, well then, these work. C's are V's too. Because C's are M's and M's are V's, so therefore C's must be V's as well. Do we know what these letters stand for? No. So can we determine whether the argument is sound? No, we can't. We don't know what these even mean. But we can determine its validity just by these little symbolic representations, these letters. See, validity has nothing to do with the content, is my point here. You don't even have to know what it is. You just have to see, does the conclusion follow from the premises? So that's what validity is all about. Now, if I said this, all mammals are vertebrates. All cats are mammals. Therefore, all cats or vertebrates. We already established that this is valid, right? Is it sound? Is this a, is this a good argument? All, all mammals are vertebrates. All cats are mammals. Therefore, all cats are vertebrates. Is the conclusion true? Are cats vertebrates? <laughs> yeah, right? Are mammals vertebrates? <laughs> Well, I think that that's, yeah, yeah. our cats, mammals. So the premise is true, this premise is true. It's valid, therefore the conclusion follows, therefore the conclusion must be true. Because the conclusion follows from the premises and both your premises are true. They're true propositions. So this is a good argument, okay? Let's talk about some more. So let's talk about soundness. Soundness is distinct from validity. Okay, soundness is um, that all the premises are true and the conclusion is true and the argument also has to be valid. 
So all, all sound arguments are also valid, but not all valid arguments are necessarily sound. Okay, you get that? All sound arguments must be valid, but not all valid arguments are necessarily sound. We'll, we'll illustrate that in a minute. So here, um, so, the, so in a sound argument, the conclusion follows from the premises, so it's valid, and all the premises are true. And therefore, a sound argument always has a true conclusion, like this one, like this cat vertebrates one. So look at this one. It's snowing outside. It's their first premise. Second premise, snow requires cold temperatures. Therefore, it must be cold outside. First question, is it valid? Okay, is it valid? Mm -hmm. Somebody demonstrate, somebody explain its validity? Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Well, if snow requires cold temperatures, and it is also snowing outside, then therefore it must be cold. Right, so it does fall, it makes sense. Now, are the premises true? And let's just say the person making the argument is telling the truth that it is snowing outside. Yeah, then I suppose that their observations are correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say that, and then number two is factual, isn't it? Snow does require cold temperatures. Therefore, it must be cold outside. This is a valid argument and it's sound. Because the premises are true, therefore the conclusion must be true. It must be cold outside. And those premises are true, so it's a sound argument. So it's valid, which is necessary to be sound, and um, it's, it's sound um, because the premises are true and therefore the conclusion is also true. So for an argument to be sound, it must be valid. And since all the premises are true the argu and the argument is valid, it's also sound. Now here's an important one. An argument can be valid and not sound, but an argument can be sound and not valid. Yet sometimes all the, this is important, sometimes all your premises can be true and yet the argument is invalid because the conclusion does not follow from the premises. Okay, let me give you an example. Some chickens lay eggs. Some grass is green. Therefore, all apples grow on trees. Those propositions, are they true? Is it true that some chickens lay eggs? Yep. Is it true that some grass is green? Yes. Is it true that all apples grow on trees? Mm -hmm. Is that a sound argument? All the premises are true and the conclusion is true. Is that sound? Why isn't it sound? Yeah, so in other words, it's invalid. It's invalid. These don't relate to each other whatsoever. Um, so it's an invalid argument, therefore it's not sound. Even though in this case, all the propositions, the premises and the conclusion, all of them are true. So soundness, the premises must be true and the argument must be valid. It's not just that the premises are true because you could have an accidentally true conclusion and that's what we have here. The fact that apples grow on trees, that conclusion is a true cl conclusion, but they didn't prove it because their premises have nothing to do with it. They were accidentally right. Okay, so you need to keep an eye on that. Does that conclusion actually follow from those premises or are they just accidentally right about that? In this case, their argument is invalid, so they were accidentally right. So all the premises were true there, but the conclusion, and the conclusion is true, but the conclusion does not follow from the premises, so it's invalid. All right, so that's validity and soundness. Any questions about that? What's, anybody, everybody understand the distinction between validity and soundness? Yeah, um, it, it, well, it could. Um, for validity, we're really talking about the structure of an argument, um, and then you have, or the form of an argument, and then you have informal fallacies, which we'll cover later in the class, which really aren't fallacies because of the form or structure. There are fallacies because of arbitrariness or inconsistency. And there are things called formal fallacies, which are errors in, in the um, structure or the form of the argument. And formal fallacies are invalid because the form is wrong, the structure is wrong. It doesn't make sense. The, the conclusion doesn't follow from the uh, premises. We'll get into that really way later on when we talk about fallacies. But yeah, um, irrelevant stuff like non sequiturs or irrelevant thesis. Um, it relates. I mean, it's, it, it could relate in your mind, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, to explain that further later on. Any other questions about validity or soundness so far? Okay, real quick. What are arguments made up of? Okay, somebody raise their hand because <laughs> they're all talking over each other. Yeah. 
Okay, what are premises and conclusions? Uh, premises are, is evidence, and then the conclusion is the point that you're trying to, the argument you're trying to put. Yeah, the, the conclusion, and they're both propositions. So arguments are made of propositions, those propositions are called premises and conclusions, and those are right, right definitions. And then validity means what? An argument is valid if, yes? If, if all the if propositions and conclusions are, well, yeah, if it's true, then it'd be solid. If, I don't know how to word it, sorry. Okay. If it has the right structure, right form. Yeah. So that the conclusion actually falls right. from the premise. Right. Premises. Yeah. Conclusion. Right. And then soundness is? Is if it's valid, <laughs> and it still follows the same, like, structure. Yeah, so it has to be valid, but there's something else that makes it sound. Yeah? More than that, you could have an accidentally true conclusion. Yeah. So if all the premises are true and the argument's valid, meaning the premises actually relate to the conclusion and prove it, then the conclusion would also be true. But you could have an accidentally true conclusion and, still, and have an unsound argument. Um, so, we're going to do exercises on this, and you'll learn more then. Once we kind of get, this, get through this section, we'll go through and do a little in-class uh, examples. But keep the distinction between validity and soundness in your mind, because that's important, really important. So let's kind of expand upon that. There's deductive and inductive arguments. And when we talk about deductive arguments, um, we talk about them within those categories we just discussed. Deductive arguments are sound or unsound, or they are valid or invalid. Okay, for deductive arguments. They're sound or unsound, or they're valid or invalid. All right, so deductive arguments. An argument in which the conclusion is certainly true if the premises are true and the argument is valid. Certainly true, okay? Deductive arguments means that conclusion is definitely the case, okay? This is a deductive argument with the mammals and the vertebrates and stuff. That's definitely the case. The snow, it's snowing outside. Snow requires cold temperatures. Therefore, it must be cold outside. That's a deductive argument. It must be cold outside. That's certain in order for snow to be there, right? So deductive arguments are either sound or unsound, or they are valid or invalid. And then later on, we'll talk about inductive arguments, which are strong or weak, so different categories there. So the premises of a valid deductive argument would, if they were true, guarantee or make certain the truth of the conclusion. So because the conclusion must follow from the premises, because the conclusion must follow from the premises in a valid argument. So if the premises are true, true propositions, and it's a valid argument, then that conclusion must be the case. It must be true in a deductive argument, certain. So even, even, um, even if the premises are false, in a valid deductive argument, the argument is still valid. It's unsound because the premises are false, but it's still valid. You can have a valid deductive argument that's a bad argument because the premises are false, but it can um, still be valid and still, the conclusion would still certainly be true if the premises were true, and that's a big if. Um, we'll talk about that, give some examples of that. Um, so a deductive argument, if a, if a deductive argument is sound, then it's valid, like we said before. The premises are true and the conclusion follows from the premises. If a deductive argument is valid, it's not necessarily sound. The conclusion could follow from the premises. Makes sense logically. But one or more of the premises could be false and that leads to a false conclusion. Okay, so if you have a, a false premise in here and the argument follows logically, well then it's gonna logically follow you to a false conclusion if you have a false premise, right? So, just like the bingo one, right? All dogs are purple, bingo's a dog, therefore bingo's purple. Um, that's a valid deductive argument, but it's not sound because the first premise is false. Not all dogs are purple, right? That's a, so that's an unsound, but valid deductive argument. So in this example, or in the example we used before, it's snowing outside, snow requires cold temperatures, therefore it must be cold outside. That's a deductive, sound deductive argument. It's valid, all the premises are true, and therefore the conclusion is true. An invalid deductive argument um, 
might be like this if I have an example here, I think I do. Um, so that's a sound one. Here's an invalid one. If it's snowing outside, then it's cold outside. It's not snowing outside. Therefore, it's not cold outside. Okay? Let's follow this, let's follow this slowly. The first premise, if it's snowing outside, then it is cold outside. Is that a true hypothetical thing? Yeah? Two, it's not snowing outside. Let's just take that for granted that the person making the argument is telling the truth. It's not snowing outside. The conclusion then is, therefore, it's not cold outside. Now, does this follow logically? Does the conclusion follow from the premises? Does this prove that it's not cold outside? No. No, why not? There you go. It can be cold and not snowing, right? This doesn't follow logically, even though the premises are true. It's invalid, right? It's an invalid argument. So this is, and therefore it's also unsound, um, not true. So the argument does not follow logically. This is actually the, the fallacy of denying the antecedent, which we'll get to later. It's possible that it's cold outside, but nevertheless is not snowing. Um, so the argument is invalid even though the premises could both be true, premise one and premise two. Um, so that's, again, kind of reviewing invalid and valid arguments. But a, a good deductive argument is, uh, is valid, and it's also sound, meaning the premises are true. Any questions on that, on deductive arguments? OK. Inductive arguments, on the other hand, then. An argument, which is, with a, with an argument in which the conclusion is likely to be true if the premises are true. So see the distinction. Deductive arguments have certain conclusions. Um, inductive arguments are probably. The conclusion is probably the case. Okay? So that's why we say that they're either strong or weak. Okay? Either the conclusion is more likely to be true or it's really not. The, the argument is not really that strong. The conclusion really doesn't follow that well. Um, it doesn't really, really give you much of a good reason to think the conclusion is probably true. So inductive arguments are either strong or weak. They're not called sound or unsound or valid or invalid like deductive arguments are. So an inductive argument is an argument that's intended by the arguer to be strong enough that if the premises were to be true, then it'd be likely that the conclusion is true. Okay? Not certainly, that's deductive, but likely, likely to be true. So, for example, um, let's look at this example. Most golden retrievers have a pleasant demeanor. My new dog, Samson, is a golden retriever. Therefore, Samson will probably have a pleasant demeanor. What do you think? Is this a strong argument or a weak argument? Do you think that conclusion is probably the case? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think it's pretty strong. Is it conclusive that this dog, Samson, who's a golden retriever, is going to have a pleasant demeanor? No. Now, why not? What's that? Okay. Right, so in other words, there could be an exception. There could be an exception. Samson might be the exception to most golden retrievers. So you can't say this is a deductive argument because it's not certain that Samson, based on these premises, that Samson's going to be definitely pleasant. But you could say, yeah, I mean, I got a new dog. He's probably going to be a good dog because most of this breed is a good dog. You can make that argument. I think that's relatively strong. But you see the difference between deductive and inductive there. It's a, it's a probably, it's likely to be true, but it's not absolutely conclusive. Um, so terms like likely or probably might be indications that it's an inductive argument, although, again, they may not be there. Somebody might not say probably or likely in their conclusion, but sometimes they will. So that might be an indication that it's an inductive argument. So inductive arguments are strong or weak. I think this is relatively strong. And this is important. Inductive arguments can get stronger or weaker when you add information, okay? When you add information. So let's look at another example.
Here's an inductive argument. Water is in the ice cube tray. The ice cube tray is in the freezer. Therefore, we'll probably have ice for the party tonight. Okay? I think that's a relatively strong inductive argument, right? Based upon that information alone, yeah, it seems like that makes sense, right? Doesn't it? What if we add information, though? What if we add information? So the original arguments are on the left. What if we made it stronger? Wires in the ice cube trays, the ice cube trays in the freezer. Sorry, this would be weaker. This is backwards. While the freezer is not plugged in, therefore we'll probably have ice for the party tonight. So if you, if you say the freezer is not plugged in, that's going to make the argument extremely weak, doesn't it? To say, yeah, we'll probably have ice for the party even though the freezer's not been plugged in. That's a really, really, really weak argument. But to make it stronger, the wires in the ice cube trays, the ice cube trays in the freezer, the freezer has been plugged in for a week and is working properly, therefore we'll probably have ice for the party tonight. That's a stronger inductive argument than the original one. We've added more information, right, to make it more likely that our conclusion is true. It's a stronger argument. So adding information can make an argument stronger or make an argument weaker for an inductive argument. So the difference between deductive and inductive arguments. Okay? The difference between deductive and inductive arguments is not so much with the words that are used in an argument, but really on the intention of the arguer. Does the person think that the conclusion is absolutely certain, or do they think the conclusion is only likely? Um, or strongly likely or somewhat likely, then it's inductive. Or if they think it's certain, then it's deductive. So we want to, for a deductive argument, we want to assess whether the argument's valid, whether the premises are true. Or if we look at it and say, well, the conclusion is not certain from these premises, but they're making a case that it's likely, then we can say it's an inductive argument. Sometimes discerning the difference between deductive and inductive can be a challenge. It kind of depends on what information you have and things like that. So. Um, sometimes that's up for debate. Here's an example, though, of an of a inductive argument. Um, a, somewhat, a somewhat strong one. A somewhat strong one. The police said that Jim committed the murder. So Jim committed the murder. Okay. That's okay. It's not conclusive. Um, not super strong. Not the worst thing. It's not as though, let's just say, well, my grandma said he committed the murder, so he committed murder. That's much weaker. But someone in authority, police, they may have some insights. Um, there's some strength to that. Not, not a ton. So what if we added information or changed it? The witness said John committed the murder, or Jim committed the murder, whoever committed the murder. So Jim committed the murder. OK. So the witness, this, this alleged witness to this alleged crime, said that Jim committed the murder, so he did. Okay, again, not conclusive, but relatively strong. Here's a stronger one. Two independent witnesses claimed Jim committed the murder. Jim's fingerprints are found on the murder weapon, and Jim confessed to the crime, so Jim committed the murder. Is that deductive or inductive? Okay, I think we got different answers. What do you, go ahead and debate it. Who, who thinks it's deductive or inductive? It's a deductive? I said deductive. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you argue for it? What do you, what do you think? I still think it's inductive, but I think it's highly likely. Okay, why, what's, what's the difference? It's inductive as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So why do you think it's deductive? <laughs> that it's certainly true. Certainly true. Okay. So you think it's certainly true. And then you two think it's inductive. Why? Because it's just like all of the facts are in support of it being likely. None of the facts are that he did commit the murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I w it is a very strong inductive argument. And here's why. Two independent witnesses claim that Jim committed the murder. Jim's fingerprints are on the murder weapon, and Jim confessed to the crime. Is it possible that he still didn't do it? It's possible. It doesn't prove with certainty. He could confess and be lying. His, his fingerprints could be on the weapon but didn't actually kill anybody with it. And two independent witnesses could be lying as well. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make it certain. But it, it's a very strong inductive argument. In fact, it, it, that would convince a jury and he would be convicted of, of murder in this case. Um, so assuming those things are... Are, um, 
are true, of course. And we, we, they, even though we're assuming they're true, it doesn't make it certain, though. Because they'll say, yeah, it actually is true that two, independents, two independent witnesses claim that he committed the murder. And his fingerprints really are there. And he did confess. Those all can be true and still not make the conclusion absolutely certain. Um, it's just very, very likely. So sometimes uh, it's important to go over these, this terminology because sometimes um, in, in our culture and in pop culture and stuff, people misuse these terms when we talk about them, particularly in logic. They'll say, well, that's a valid argument. What they mean by that is that it's a good argument or it's a sound argument, and they misuse the term. Or people talk about Sherlock Holmes, and he really deduced this. Well, really, it's in, most of the, his stuff is inductive. Um, he's looking at evidence and saying, well, it's very likely based upon these evidences that it's the case that whatever. Um, so Sherlock Holmes really does a lot of uh, inductive argumentation rather than deductive, uh, if you're familiar with, with detective Sherlock Holmes. Can you ever have a deductive uh, conclusion Um, potentially, it, it, this is this is where the, some of the difficulties are. Um, it depends on how skeptical you want to be. <laughs> I mean, if you have um, video, evidence. video evidence, things like that, where you can have multiple witnesses and it's very clear, but then what, what can you say? Well, that was doctored, that was manipulated video evidence. Okay, maybe very skeptical. So that's where, when we talk about this philosophically, it's, it's actually kind of difficult uh, to get d deep into it and saying when is something certainly deductive because you could be um, such a skeptic on certain things that, well, it's only really, really likely. And that's why I said it's up for debate sometimes. You have to kind of analyze it on a case-by-case -case scenario. So I have to think about that. And crimes, I mean, most of the time it's going to be inductive because you can't show with absolute certainty that somebody's not lying and things like that. Now, now God could, could make that, you know, say if everything, God's not talking about likelihoods, he's talking about what is true. So he, he does deductive things. Um, but for us, we can only kind of go off, off of evidences and kind of add things up to see what's more likely or, or less likely. Um, so, if, so for a deductive argument, if you ask yourself the question, okay, in this argument, if the premises are actually true, is the conclusion certainly true? If the conclusion is certainly true, then, the, then that's a valid deductive argument. If you ask yourself the question looking at an argument, is, if the premises are true, is the conclusion certainly true? And you say, well, no, it's not certainly true, then it's going to be an inductive argument. That's really one of the big, big differences. Inductive arguments deal with what's probably true, and deductive deals with what is certainly true. They're certainly true if the premises are true. So, Michael, do we have those papers? Um, I want to do an exercise that goes over really everything we've covered so far. And this will be a little bit, I think this will be the most helpful um, part of this, this section because you get to actually do it yourselves. Um, let me see if I can pull these up here too. I, I have some. I'm out, I'll take it, <laughs> just in case there's some discrepancy, but thank you. All right, so we're going to go through this section covering basically everything we've gone through so far. Let me see what time is. For about an hour. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go through. I'm going to kind of just go around the room and, you know, talk about it. So... The first, th this first exercise is a, is a questioning what are, which of these are propositions, okay? So if somebody wants to remind us, what's a proposition? Truth, truth claim, right. So which one of these, in other words, are truth claims? So if we want to start um, over on this side of the room and we'll just kind of go, um, so if you'll do number one over there, I'll read it. So this is, this is number one. The shape of our bodies, whether bottom heavy or thick in the middle, 
is related to hormone binding structures on the surface of fat cells. Is that a proposition? Okay. Why? Right. Okay. Next one, Brian there, number two. Isn't the EEG activity of the conditioned rabbit altered by olfactory ball of waveform patterns? Okay, why not? Because he's asking. He's asking you directly instead of being like, this is. Right. So questions are not making claims. Well, in this case, at least, it's not a rhetorical question. So um, it, see, don't, get, don't get bogged down by the fact that we probably have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> um, the thing is, we can, we can recognize that this is not a proposition. He's not making any claim of truth. He's not saying it is the case. Uh, he's asking, is this, is this the case? All right, number three over here. Mo most of the matter in the universe cannot be seen. It is a proposition. That's right. All right, number four. Alzheimer's disease is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. You're good. <laughs> we, are, we are determining whether these are propositions or not, so whether they're truth claims or not. So is number four a proposition? It's a proposition. Okay. So it's making a truth claim. Now, what if that's not true? What if it's the fifth leading cause? Is this still a proposition? Yes, it is. It's still a proposition because it's a truth claim. All right. Number five. We'll go to the back row here on the left. Um, number five, what time is it? It's you. <laughs> and is it a proposition? What's that? It is a proposition? You think it is? What's the truth claim? The time. The is, time? Is, is, this, is the statement, what, is the, what time is it? Is that a truth claim? Is that a proposition, in other words? Okay, why do you think it's a proposition? I don't know how to say it. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to explain. Okay. Does anybody have another answer? You do? Or go ahead. I think it's not a proposition. Okay, why is that? Because asking is like a question. Mm -hmm. Well, it is something that somebody's saying, but it, and it's a question. To kind of fill in the gap there, all it is, it's, he's, the person is not saying something is true. If somebody said it's 3.30, that's a proposition. It's the case that it is 3.30 in the afternoon. But saying what time was it is not asserting something to be true. It's asking a question. Um, so it's not a proposition. You won't find that in an argument, in other words, because it's not a proposition. Um, wouldn't make any sense to be in an argument. All right. Uh, number six, Pluto is not really a planet, it's an ice ball. What do you think? Number six. Well, oh, it's a proposition. Okay. Why is that? Because it could possibly be proved to be an ice ball. Okay. That's true, but not totally relevant to whether it's a proposition or not. I mean, it kind of is. It's just, all is, it, is, it, is it a claim that something is true? And it is. They're saying that it's, it's the case that Pluto is not a planet, it's an ice ball. So that's what a proposition. It's just somebody saying, it is the case that X. It's the case that whatever. And this person's saying, it's the case that Pluto is not really a planet, it's an ice ball. If that is a proposition. Number seven over here. Um, why doesn't anybody like me? <laughs> it is not a proposition. That's right. That's right. Right. All right. Next one. Number eight. Nobody likes me. Yeah, it is a proposition. It's making a claim for truth. All right. It is a proposition. Number eight is a proposition. Nobody likes me is a proposition. It's saying, it's make, and you can make an argument and say, look, everybody throws stuff at me and they, you know, whatever. You can make, give it a good inductive argument for that. 
everybody curses me and all that. So, all right, number nine, let's just raise your hand if you want to do nine and 10. So number nine. What's that? It's not a proposition number seven. Number seven is not a proposition. because She's uh, actually making a truth claim. She's making a truth claim that nobody does like it. That's a proposition. Number eight, nobody likes me, is a proposition. Number seven is a question, so it's not. Within that question is the truth. She's. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if I say, why does anybody like me? I'm assuming nobody likes me. Sure, so you're saying it's a rhetorical question which has a, as a really a subtle proposition. You can make that argument. I could, I could go along with that. You could go along with that. Okay. I guess if you just said, does anybody like me, that would be clear, clearly not a proposition. But yeah, I think maybe you're right about that. It's a rhetorical question or it's something that assumes that there is a, a proposition in it. So that's a good point. Uh, number nine, if we have dessert, then we'll have coffee. Just raise your hand. Hmm? Why? Uh, yeah, and this is called a hypothetical proposition. If this is the case, then that is the case. So if we have dessert, then we'll have coffee. That's a hypothetical proposition. It's not saying that we will have dessert. It's not saying that we will have coffee. It's saying if we have dessert, then we'll have coffee. So it's a hypothetical proposition. It is indeed a proposition. Number 10, Christianity is the only worldview that, that can account for the preconditions of intelligibility. Is that a proposition or no? Yeah. It is. It is a truth claim. And you will learn about that in the other class in apologetics. All right, next one. This one's interesting. Um, identifying arguments and parts of arguments. So we're going to deal with a number of things. This is a little more intense. Um, we'll go around the room again. So we're going to identify the premises of the argument, the conclusion of the argument, whether the argument is deductive or inductive. If it's deductive, whether it's sound or unsound, valid or invalid, and if it's inductive, whether it's strong or weak. This is really a, a catch-all. So let's start um, again over here. I'll read the argument, and then you're gonna identify those things. They're up there at the top if you, if you forget everything. So here's the argument. Two teenagers saw the movie Natural Born Killers and went out on a killing spree. A number of teenagers who have committed violence at schools have spent hours playing video games filled with, with murder and violence. Violent media causes teenagers to be violent. So first, what are the premises and the conclusion? Um, the premises are that like, the two teenagers saw the movie and were on a killing spree, mm -hmm. and that the number of teenagers who have committed violence at schools for many hours playing video games filled with murder and violence. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Um, and notice that there's no conclusion indicator in here. There's no therefores or anything like that, but it's, that's correct. Okay, is the argument um, deductive or inductive? Um, inductive. Inductive? Is that what you said? Yeah. That's right. Why is it inductive? Right. It doesn't prove it with certainty, does it? What if, what, if, what if it was like this? You add information to it, and it says, and uh, these teenagers um, had been planning to murder people six months before they saw the movie and played these games. That would really weaken the argument, wouldn't it? So there could be other reasons. So therefore, in that case, it's... Uh, well, what do you think? Is this argument by itself, um, is it strong or weak? Decently strong. Okay. <laughs> Do you think that this argument gives you um, the conclusion here addresses the cause? So the conclusion is violent media causes teenagers to be violent. Do you think they've established cause in this argument? They haven't established cause. Now, what if they'd said this? Look, these teenagers were just the most peaceful boys in the whole world, and they were nice to people and animals and all of a sudden. Then all of a sudden, they saw this movie, played these games for a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden they went on a killing spree. That would make it a little stronger to establish some sort of cause effect there, but they really haven't established any cause here. They've just given some evidences um, that they think might support it. So it's, it's not great. I wouldn't say it's very strong. I think it's pretty weak, not, not super strong, because they haven't established cause. They need more information to establish cause there. All right, uh, next one there, um, Brian. It would be wise for Rob to begin a daily program of exercise. After all, research has shown that people who do at least 30 minutes of a day of rigorous or vigorous uh, exercise reduce their risk of heart disease and some forms of cancer. 
So what are the um, premise, what's the premise using the conclusion? Uh, the premise, I believe, is that people who, sh uh, show, who do at least 30 minutes a day of vigorous exercise reduce the risk of heart disease in some form of cancer. That's right. And then, what was the other question? What's the conclusion? The conclusion of that it would be wise for Rob, but they assert that interestingly towards the beginning. Right, so sometimes in an argument, this is important, sometimes conclusions are the start of an argument. They say, hey, this is the case, let me tell you why, and give some reasons for it. And in this case, they, that's what they say, hey, Rob, you, he should really do an exercise program, and here's why. Yeah. Right, so you can do that. The order is not gonna be indicative of whether, it's a pre whether the premise comes first or conclusion comes first, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's something you'll see here. Um, something else, this is kind of a tricky one, because you'll notice that there's an unstated premise in here. There's a premise that's merely assumed but has not been said. And that's this. You should do things that reduce your risk of heart disease and some forms of cancer. They just assume that we all agree, yeah, we should do that. We should avoid those things, right? But they don't actually say it because it's something that they assume. And sometimes that's okay. We'll talk about this later on, but it's called an enthymeme when you do that. You have an unstated premise, um, or even sometimes an unstated conclusion because it's so obvious. But in this case, there's an unstated premise, um, which is, well, people, research shows that people who do this exercise, you know, reduce their risk of heart disease and cancer. You should do things that reduce your risk of heart disease and cancer. Therefore, you know, Rob should begin a program of exercise. Is this inductive or deductive? I would say that my first thoughts upon it was that it was inductive. Inductive? Yeah. Okay. Can you uh, give support for that? In the... Is that he's proclaiming evidence in the sense of after all. So he's saying evidence that he, he knows, but it's so... We know that he says it is true, but we don't know for sure that the 30 minutes a day of vigorous exercise like, will reduce their risk of heart disease. Or okay. Disease. Well, let's just take it for granted that that is the case. And then, then it's deductive. Obviously. You think it's deductive? So you think it's certainly the case that Rob should begin a daily program of exercise? Yeah. If he, does, okay. if he wants to avoid that, then he should, certainly should. Okay. What if we add information? After all, research shows that people who do at least 30 minutes of exercise a day of rigorous exercise or whatever reduce their risk of heart disease and some forms of cancer. Rob just had open heart surgery yesterday. Therefore, it would be wise for Rob to begin a daily program of exercise. Right. So does it prove it certainly? Right. So what's that mean? Is it deductive or inductive? Inductive. Right. Because adding information here could really strengthen the argument or weaken it. And adding that he just had open heart surgery really weakens the argument that he should start doing rigorous exercise every day. Um, so it doesn't prove it with certainty. So this is, as it stands with this information, it's a strong inductive argument, I'd say, um, because generally speaking, for most people, yeah, it'd be a good thing to start exercising. But there are exceptions, like people who are, you know, just had surgery or things like that. So it'd be strong. Um, but again, adding information either strengthens or weakens an inductive argument. All right, over here, thirdly, all cats are gray. Mr. Bingley is a cat, therefore Mr. Bingley is gray. What's the premises and the conclusion? All cats, are gray. all cats are gray, Mr. Bingley is a cat, premises, conclusion, therefore Mr. Bingley is gray. Okay, what is it, deductive or inductive? Deductive. What do you say? Deductive. Deductive, okay. Is it valid? Yeah. Okay, is it sound? Should be, but you don't know, so. Why don't we know? We don't know if Mr. Bingley is. No, oh, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, I guess it is. So oh, that's our turn. It's sound? Yeah. Okay, what's it mean to be when an argument sound? It's, uh, it's valid and all the points follow the, like all the, the conclusion follows the premises. So that's what valid means, that all the conclusion follows in the premises. And you're right that it is valid. But what's sound mean? That it's valid and. Yeah. And all the points. And go. So look at it again. Are all the are all the propositions here? Are all the premises true? Yeah. They are. They are. 
Yes. <laughs> well, no, but I'm assuming, I'm not, sorry, assuming that it's valid. But, so it's not assuming it's so that's okay. Yeah, that's if it's valid. For validity. You know when we like take okay, yeah, their no. word for their word yeah. versus like what we actually yeah, know to be true. When there's things, it's case by case. When there are things that are more objectively known, if somebody's saying, "Well, hey." You know, it's like I said, it's snowing outside. Well, we're just going to assume for this, that this person is not just straight up lying in this argument, that they're looking out the window and say, hey, look, it's snowing. It's That's not something we can verify because we're not there with the arguer. Right. But in this case, it's not the case that all cats are gray. We know that. All I have to do is show you the black cat, an orange yeah. cat, a white cat. We know that. Um, it's not the case that all cats are gray. Mr. Bingley's a cat, therefore Mr. Bingley is gray. That's valid because the conclusion follows from that. But since the first premise is false, the conclusion is not, right, it's so not a sign. When there, when there are things, um, yeah, I mean, when, when things are known to yeah. be false, like we know that the first yeah. premise is not true, um, we can say it's unsound. It's un yeah. um, but again, this, this is why there's difficulties here. Yeah, Terry. You know, it, it could be that Mr. Uh, it could be that this gentleman that all the cats he's ever seen are gray, and that is truth to him. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you would have to re educate him. Right. Well, you'd have to say, look, you, you make the claim all cats are gray, I want to challenge you on that. And I want to show you my cat is black. So you're wrong. Because, the case, it, because if, if one cat is black, <laughs> if one cat is black, then that's the case that it's not the case that all cats are gray. Because that means. <laughs> but that is the case a lot of people argue with. Hmm? Because. Sure. You'd have to bring it back and say, okay, I don't accept your first premise that all cats are gray. I want you to make an argument for that. You need to demonstrate to me with premises that it is indeed the case that all cats are gray. I don't accept that. And you can make your argument, your counter argument, saying, here's why. Go on Google and find a billion cats that aren't gray. You can. Um, that's, that's the way you would argue that way. If they're going to really assert, this is really true, all cats are gray. They have to support that, and you can counter that. So you're kind of making them argue a separate argument about whether cats are gray or not. Now, if they could prove that, then this argument would be sound. But of course, they can't, because it is not the case that all cats are gray. Some people may argue, well, that's not a cat, because it's not gray. Well, we'll get to that, actually, Terry. That's, that's, called, a <laughs> that's called a persuasive definition. It's, it's a fallacy to do that, or a rhetorical definition. All right, where do we leave off? You? When it rains, my lawn gets wet. It's raining, therefore my lawn is wet. What are the premises and the conclusion? Um, when it rains, my lawn gets wet. It is raining, are the premises. And then my lawn is wet is the conclusion. Mm -hmm. So it is deductive, and it is valid, and it is sound. Excellent. That's exactly right. Good. OK. Next one. Back here. This is my, I like this one. All toasters are items made of gold. All items made of gold are time machines. Therefore, all toasters are time machines. What are the premises and conclusions? Um, the conclusion is all toasters are made of gold, and all items. I'm sorry, what did you say? Those are, you said the conclusion's what? All right, the conclusion's the last one, therefore. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, that's one of them. Mm -hmm. and what's the other premise? <clears throat> and the items made of gold are time machines. Right. Okay, so is this deductive or inductive? Deductive. Okay. Is it valid? Uh, yes. Okay. Can you explain it? Because this one might be a little tricky to people. Can you explain why it's valid? Um, so you can explain that all posters are made of gold. And if all toasters were made of gold, they're time machines. Thus, therefore, all toasters are time machines. Okay, let's look at, it. Look at the second premise. All items made of gold are time machines. Okay. So all items made of gold are time machines. We know that toasters are in that category of items made of gold. Right? So if toasters are in the category of items made of gold, and items made of gold are time machines, well, that means that toasters are time machines too, doesn't it? That's valid. That's right. So is it sound or unsound? 
I'm sorry? <laughs> Why is it on sound? Okay, remember the definition of soundness. We already established it's valid, so that's checkbox one for soundness, but there's another checkbox for soundness, which is what? All the premises are true. All the premises are true. It's very important for soundness. You guys got validity down pretty good, I think, but soundness, it's distinct from validity. Sound arguments are valid and all the premises are true. Now, as a matter of fact, both of these premises are false. It's not the case that all toasters are items made of gold. And it's not the case that I just made a goal or time machines, obviously. Um, so because the premises are false, it's unsound, although it is still valid because it does follow, but they're not true premises. So that's why you get a false conclusion there as well. All right, next one. Most people like chocolate. Charlie's a person, therefore Charlie probably likes chocolate. Where are the premises in the conclusion? Uh, the first two are the premises. Mm -hmm. The last one is the conclusion. That's right. Okay, why do you think it's weak? This is somewhat subjective to the person, but I want to hear what you think. Uh, it doesn't really give it. Uh, what I have here is established cause, but I'm not really. <laughs> that was for the other one, the first one, which is violent media causes teenagers to be violent. I didn't think the premises really showed why that would be a cause. But for here, do you, I'm just curious, do you think that the first premise is, is true? Most people like chocolate? No. Okay. So you think, most, you think that people who like chocolate in the minority? I don't know. I'm just wondering. <laughs> Again, it's somewhat subjective. I guess it is not the minority. Okay, so the majority of people like chocolate. You'd probably maybe agree with that. Yeah. Again, you know, this is somewhat like, well, yeah, that's probably the case. That's why you have this inductive thing. Yeah, most people. I would say that that's probably the case. Most people like chocolate. You know, more, most people you meet on the street would say, yeah, I like chocolate. There are people who don't. I know people who don't. But the most people that I know do, and, you know, probably you know as well. Charlie's a person. Okay. So Charlie would probably like chocolate. Based upon this information alone, it's okay. You know, if you added information, it could make it stronger or weaker. What does that even mean? Okay, so if we added this argument, good question, thank you for asking, seriously. Most people like chocolate, Charlie's a person, Charlie absolutely despises chocolate cake. Therefore, he probably likes chocolate. That's a weak argument, isn't it? Because you added the information that we know he hates chocolate cake, so he probably doesn't like chocolate bars or whatever, you know? Or we know, oh, most people like chocolate. Charlie's a person, we know that he really likes, you know, whatever, something that's similar to chocolate. Well, he probably likes chocolate. That could maybe strengthen it. He really likes sweets. Charlie really likes sweets. We know that in general. We know that he, he likes sweet stuff. He has a sweet tooth. Therefore, Charlie probably likes chocolate. That's a decently strong argument. So the, so the, the added information makes things, makes the conclusion more likely or less likely. And so we talked about that one with the exercise. And we said, well, yeah, most people, you know, exercise reduces your risk of cancer. You know, Rob just had open heart surgery, so he should probably do that. That's a weak argument because that added information that he just had heart surgery really weakens the claim that he, or the conclusion that he should start a rigorous exercise routine. But if we say, yeah, and he, you know, um, is not super in shape and really needs to, you know, whatever, deal with some of health issues, he should really start exercising. We could strengthen the argument. Does that make sense? Helps strengthen the, the conclusion to be more likely, and that's what you want to do if you're going to make an inductive, inductive argument, is add more information that will strengthen the likelihood of the conclusion. So you remember the criminal trial. Well, the fact that the police said that Jim is guilty, okay, he might be, he may not be, but the fact that he confessed and that his fingerprints are on the murder weapon and that two independent witnesses said he did it, they saw him do it. That's very strong um, because that added information strengthens the likelihood of the conclusion. Um, does that make sense? Is this making sense to people so far? Okay, I hope this is, I hope this exercise is helping. Yes, Steve. You're saying this is weak or strong? 
I'm saying this is relatively strong. It's not very much information, though. Um, I think it's true that most people like chocolate. Um, so you could say, yeah. I mean, if I was saying, what, what should we get for Charlie as a treat? I might say, well, most people like chocolate. We could probably get him a, a candy bar. OK, we might go along with that. So OK, that kind of makes sense. There might be information that we don't know that would really weaken the argument. But as it stands, I think it's relatively strong. But that's somewhat subjective, depending on what you think. Yeah, I think it's relatively strong, as it is. And so, well, since it's inductive, we don't talk about valid or invalid. We talk about strong or weak, really. Um, and even though it has, it has an inductive indicator in it, probably, Charlie probably likes chocolate, that's going to indicate that it's an inductive argument. Um, so we'd say it's, it's strong-ish. All right, where were we? Over here. All right, here's one. In some states, no felons are eligible to vote. In those states, some professional athletes are felons. Therefore, in some states, some professional athletes are not eligible to vote. Premises and conclusion. Uh, the premises are the first two sentences, and then the conclusion is the last. That's right. Um, I think it's valid. Okay, so you think it's deductive or inductive first? Um, okay, see, I'm a little confused. Okay. Because I feel like it's valid, which makes me think that it's deductive, because it, I feel like it follows the right formula. Like, it is, like, the conclusion goes along with the premises. But I don't know. I don't like the, how it's like some. <laughs> and whatever. it throws me off. Not, it makes me feel like it's not certain or sure. It makes me feel like it's inductive. But I don't know. OK. I still stick with deductive and valid. Okay. The fact that it says some states and um, some professional athletes doesn't make, does not relate to um, probability or likelihood. It's talking about not all and not none, but some. So it's not saying all, um, you know, all states or in no states. It's saying in some states. Um, so it's not talking about likely. It's just talking about um, how, you know, again, just some. So it is, it is deductive. Um, and you're right, it is valid. So, can you expl can you try to explain why it's valid? Kind of walk us through it. Right. Yeah. So it follows. Um, again, the structure is right, like you said. Um, you could even take out the information and put in, you know, letters instead, and it'd still be valid. Um, now, based upon the content, now we're talking about soundness. You have a question? Yeah. I think we're assuming that some uh, refers to the same set of states in each right? Yes. The second premise says in those states, so in the same some states that are in the first premise. Mm -hmm. So in. Mm -hmm. I was picking it apart too much. Like, what if it's not talking about the same state? I right. think it would make the argument stronger if they were like named or listed out, like sure. in Nebraska, you know, or Oklahoma, or whatever. So it'd make it a clearer argument, which is yeah. what we're going for. We want that. So you're right. I think that's a good, good observation, very good observation. Um, but I think the fact that it says in, in those states helps you know, eliminate some ambiguity, but you're right, it doesn't, it, it could be clearer, it could give the list of states um, instead of just saying some states. All right, so do you think it's sound then? Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Because I like the sound of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's sound because it's deductive and valid, and if it was unsound, then that would be contradicting everything else that the party said. Well, that's true, but there's something, there's something that you guys need to remember about soundness that I think is kind of one thing that you're forgetting. Yes, validity is something that's necessary for soundness to be there, but what else is necessary for it to be sound? All the premises have to be true. That's it. And these are. These are. So, um, so therefore, you can say that conclusion is certain 
completely true because the premises are true and the conclusion follows from the premises, aka is valid. So that premise is true. This is a valid, sound, deductive argument. That means you can depend upon that conclusion, um, assuming that those premises are true. All right, next one. I own everything in my house. There's a guitar in my house, so I own that guitar. What are the premises and the conclusion? Uh, the first two sentences are the premises, and the last one is the conclusion. That's right. Is it uh, deductive or inductive? Deductive. You say deductive? Yeah. That's correct. Valid or invalid? Valid. Valid? Valid. Okay. And it's sound. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. Next one. Um, Again, we'll just kind of look, open these last two up for, for discussion. All right, it's most probable that our neighbor stole our parrot. We left our parrot in the house this morning. The nearest neighbor lives one mile away. When we got home from work, the parrot was gone. What's the conclusion? That's right, the first one. It's most probable that our neighbor stole our parrot. That's the conclusion. So what are the premises? Yeah, everything else. Remember, there's only one conclusion um, in an argument, so the rest are going to be premises there. Inductive or deductive? Okay, why? Inductive, but why? Mm -hmm. So, what are other possibilities? It blew away. Yeah. <laughs> right. Michael came and stole it. Right. And as it's his collection, but it's still inductive because he wasn't the neighbor. Right. <laughs> That's right. So what do you think? Is it strong or weak? Yeah, I'd say it's very weak. Very weak, as it does not at all um, establish anything that would make the, the neighbor the, the, uh, the criminal here. All right, last one. All whales are mammals. Killer whales are whales. Therefore, killer whales are mammals. What are the premises and the conclusion? What's the conclusion? All right, so the other ones are premises, right? Deductive or inductive? Mm -hmm. Is it valid? Yes. Okay, why is it valid? Because assuming they're true, and it follows it logically. Right, it follows logically. The conclusion follows from the premises. Since killer whales are whales, and all whales are mammals, then killer whales must also be mammals. Um, is it uh, sound or unsound? Okay, why is it sound? The premises are true. Premises are true, and it's valid. Remember, sound has to have both of those. You have to check off both boxes. It has to be valid, and the premises have to be true, because just having true premises does not make it a sound argument. Because it could be invalid. It could be some chickens lay eggs, some grass is green, therefore you know, the sky is blue or whatever. Those, those are all true propositions, but they're not a sound argument because it's invalid. All right, let's see. Let's, um, let's go ahead and take a little break, and then we'll come back in well, let's see, a few minutes and uh, see what time it is.